So we'll get started in a minute. Um, keep in mind, this is gonna be an interactive uh, session. So please feel free to submit questions through the chat as we go along. Uh, we'll have a little bit of banter going back and forth. This is gonna be more casual presentations. So hopefully uh, we'll all, all have a little bit of fun with it. And we have uh, Kristen McKay joining us as well. She is our Director of Marketing and she will chime in at, at some point. And uh, so just wanna let you know that uh, sh she'll be out there as well. And Kristen, how do, how do we look in terms of number of participants joining? We've got about- I think uh, that the, the um, attendance has started slow so we can go ahead and get started, but some housekeeping first before we begin. Today's session is being recorded. So I will be distributing a um, link to the replay uh, within a, a couple hours of the session's conclusion. Please do use the chat box today. This is going to be a live interactive session. So use the chat box to send in your questions and your comments throughout the presentation to our panelists today. And without further ado, I'll turn it back over to you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. So we'll get started. I wanna first in introduce uh, our speakers and and uh, the companies that we represent. Uh, so depending on when you first heard about GovInvest, you might think about uh, pension and OPEB modeling, but the co company has grown rapidly and is now in 16 states. Um, we have a larger product offering and have well over 300 clients. Uh, GovInvest is a technology firm uh, for specializing in financial modeling software for state and local governments in the areas, as I mentioned, pension, OPEB, labor forecasting, and this is all feeding into an entity-wide uh, forecasting suite. Um, the licensing agreement includes uh, consulting services um, for local, uh, with uh, local government practitioners, uh, financial consultants and actuaries. Uh, together, we help you measure, model, and manage your long-term liabilities. We are also fortunate to have with us today, Julio Morales, uh, who's joining us from Urban Futures and has a long illustrious history uh, working for a number of different uh, firms. And Julio, if you would like to introduce yourself a bit, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan. Uh Obviously, I focus on pension and OPEB almost exclusively, but in many cases, or what will be the topic of today, uh, we help you price and structure uh, municipal bonds and develop long-range financial plans. Um, I think that GovInvest and uh, our services complement each other. I know that Ira, Dan, and I are working together, for example, with the city of Upland. And Dan and I, uh, I think I met Dan when I was working at PFM uh, in a former life. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you guys. Yeah, and if, uh, if you don't notice, uh, we share a, a very uh, uh, jovial uh, relationship and we like to kid around. So uh, excuse us for our, uh, uh, our, our childish behavior at times, but uh, we'll ho hopefully we're gonna have fun and we'll walk you through the rest of uh, this session. So, uh, Getting started, I thought we would start with a poll to understand why you are here today. So I'm going to activate the poll um, right now, and it's why are you attending today? So let me give you uh, 15 seconds to answer your questions. Um, answers are still coming in rapidly. We'll give it a new uh, few more seconds. Um, so we we have looks like 52 attendees today. So 73% of the vote has come in thus far, um, and uh, seems to to 
be slow like CNN. Here. Sorry? I said, it's like CNN. You can report live. Yeah. <laughs> So it uh, looks like it's, it's slowing. Um, about 82% of the vote has come in. And most people are looking uh, to, to um, um, be better understand the risk <coughs> and rewards. Um, and there, there is uh, uh, an element that I, I suspected to be so that the topic keeps coming up and you, you, know, you wanna just be able to address your council or city manager on, on uh, you, you know, uh, some of the concerns that you may, may have. Hopefully we can enlighten uh, you to uh, I, you know, either reaffirm your concerns or um, uh, dissuade you. Um, but uh, it is a very personal decision. So, um, you know, POBs aren't for every agency. Some, some places they're a non-starter just with the politics. But um, as finance directors, I applaud you for, for actually showing up because uh, even though a solution may not be perfect for your agency, uh, understanding that, um, you know, makes us makes us a, a uh, all, all the uh, better. You know, um, um, leaders in our, our our community. Well, so, I feel a, better that no one's already issued them and is finding out later on what they've gotten themselves into. Yeah. <laughs> right. Although I don't know if we should be concerned that some people have no idea why they're here. <laughs> All right, so moving uh, right along. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the things that we've, uh, we, I think we all are in, a, in agreement. Um, I think uh, Ira, Julia, and I all view a lot of these issues the same way. Um, you should look to um, examine other alternatives before going straight to a POB. And having that long-term outlook um, is not only a, uh, a practice that's recommended by the three of us, but I hear that from many FAs is, uh, as well as the rating agencies, is to have a long-term forecast and see the problem early. Uh, because when you take early action, you have more options um, uh, available to you and it takes less force. So. Uh, coming up a 30 degree ramp is much easier than going up a 60 degree ramp. And so if you wait to the last minute, your, your options uh, start to close and uh, you have, you have few, fewer and fewer um, um, So did I just... Okay. Am I the one that's frozen? Boo. Sorry. Oh, no, I, I'm having trouble hearing. Okay. Julio, um, are, are you available to speak to the, the strategies? Absolutely, you just froze for a second. So can we go to the next slide? Oh, it says my, okay. Can you hear me? I can, I can hear, hear you. you, Julio, yeah. Okay, just sit for a second as unstable. So uh, if someone has seen one of my presentations in the past, we generally take a look at funding strategies. We break them up between budgeting approaches and financing approaches. This all goes hand in hand in thinking about your financial uh, position collectively or in a holistic perspective. So it's we've talked before that for almost every finance director, 80% of a city's budget is labor related costs. So it's thinking about how you're gonna address this. And your pension costs are perhaps one of the most significant liabilities you're gonna have. So we always look at it sequentially, having POBs in the back end. So we try to look at the use of reserves and one-time money, establishing a pension stabilization fund to pay for budgeting, recycling savings, which is if you have money from one area or for financing, applying that. But those are all budgetary uh, solutions. That goes also without saying all the other steps you may have already taken, budget cuts, uh, ballot measures, outsourcing, all of those have already been done. 
but then you get to these financing approaches. So we'd look at systematically what you have available as far as resources and say, what can you do from a financing perspective? A leverage refunding is simply taking a taxes and bond issue, taking the money and restructuring with savings up front and applying to CalPERS. A concept of tax exempt exchange often works for water districts, which is you, um, they typically build up reserves and pay for projects as much as possible on a pay-go basis. We would strongly encourage you to use those monies in your reserves and then issue tax exempt bonds, which are less expensive than pension obligation bonds. And at the very end, and most important, we try to minimize the amount of pension obligation bonds, develop a whole plan, but those are also a very compelling financing uh, option. We'll go into the mechanics of that in a bit. So next we're gonna look at some of the POB uh, considerations. Um, obviously we're all looking at this because the savings can be compelling. Um, you can see um, some agencies are looking to lop off this, uh, the, this curve on the top where your, your default payment structure may be and swap that out for a fixed payment, uh, perhaps that has a, a, a long, longer, maybe not a longer maturity for the entire, but spreads out the pain over a longer period of time that enhances intergenerational equity. Uh, so um, your residents here today aren't suffering um, you know, for, for services where out here you've got, you know, more equitable, um, use of, uh, um, tax taxable, uh, um, or your, your tax proceeds. Um, Julio, Ira, do you do anything that you want to add to, to, uh, this chart? Yeah. I mean, the, the thing is the, the savings that you see here, the savings that, that are being talked about in relation to pension obligation bonds are bigger than, the savings that you can get through almost any other uh, financing opportunity that's out there right now. And that's what makes this so compelling. And it's very important, again, to keep this in the context that Julio talked about before, that this is not, this isn't an answer to all of your problems. This is one piece of part of a, a total funding perspective. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of agencies, Think, have thought in the past of pension obligation bonds uh, as the answer to their problems. That once you do this, you don't have to uh, pay attention to your pension funding anymore. And that is far from true. Uh, it's it can be effective. It can be a great tool. It can be a powerful tool, but you still need to monitor. You still need to pay attention uh, to make sure that things are going right and to keep track of all the other part piece of the puzzle that Julio had talked about earlier. I'll add one more thing if that's okay, Dan. That blue line is what your POBs are, and we'll go over it a little bit later, that your liability is an ongoing dynamic amount that they will add bases. And the most important thing the rating agencies want to know is that you understand that, that this isn't I solved the problem, but rather I'm addressing it and I understand what we're doing going forward. And I think that's part of it is understanding the risk, but then it's also making sure you have a plan as we've talked about in the future. But that's the number one question or comment we get from the rating agencies to the city council, city managers. You understand that this kind of uh, refinance is a past due amount, but you may have other liabilities going forward. And, and this, is, this is a picture of your payment of your unfunded liability and only the part right that's now. the unfunded liability. Paying off your unfunded liability doesn't mean that you stop making contributions to the pension fund. You're still making your normal cost, your cost attributable to each year of service as it is being earned. So you're still going to have ongoing contributions. Uh, part of the, the appeal of this is people can, can think about this in a manner similar to refinancing a mortgage on your house because the rates get lower and you're refinancing a lower rate. And that's good as a start, but it, it's not a complete picture because if you refinance the mortgage on your house uh, and you don't decide to put another mortgage on your house, then you stop making mortgage payments. Uh, but that's not what happens with the pension plan. Things can happen outside of your control. Things are going to keep going on as employees continue to work. And we'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later in the presentation. And that's the next slide, isn't it? 
So, you know, many of you may be wondering, well, you know, GFOA back in 2007 issued an advisory against POBs. Um, and Emily Brock, who is their federal liaison, uh, was quoted in IPE magazine uh, as late as April 21, um, noting that no matter the economic environment, these bonds represent considerable financial risks. The invested proceeds may fail to earn more of the interest rate owed over the long term of the bonds, leading to increased overall liabilities for the government. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Julio to respond to that uh, uh, objection by GFOA. You know, that's a great point. And I might start back with the GFOA. Um, in a former life, when I was a finance director and city manager, I served on the National Debt Advisory Committee. And it's important to understand the GFOA's perspective. The GFOA <clears throat> basically provides best practices and financial advice to finance directors throughout the country. I tend to believe that the practice, uh, having worked at, you know, at PFM, we had a national practice. What we did in California often led the market, the entire market. So what you're thinking about is this small town in Kentucky or the city of McLean Fog in Illinois with 5,000 people in it. You have to provide the same advice to that small city as you do the city of New York City or Julia Cooper, for example, if the city of San Jose, we served at the same time the GFOA. So they write this large policy. And in general, as they've had this opposition, if we ignore the next slide, they have actually said POBs are risky. You should not issue them. But remember, that's a large blanket statement. And I believe that if you follow a lot of their things, we agree with a number of these. I, I don't know if it's not showing up. I don't see it on the slide, Dan. <laughs> yeah. There we go. I didn't know that it was automated. So first they talk about complex instruments, swaps, cap, uh, cabs, and derivatives. Um, the next uh, component they also talk about is that uh, they increase your debt burden uh, they reduce your, uh, your flexibility and they take from a soft to a hard liability. The next item they highlight, and there's six of these, is uh, they are non-refundable. They have a make whole call. And number four is uh, they extend payment or finance normal costs. Five, which is they view them as a credit um, as a credit may not be viewed as a credit positive or a credit negative. And lastly, the point that she made, reinvestment or bond proceeds um, may fail to uh, reach the rate on, on the POBs and you're subject to market and time and risk. That's absolutely the case. But we coined a term POBs 2.0, helping going through a study to the San Jose. Here's the thing. In California, there have been a number of POBs issued, nearly more than 50, $6 billion of the POBs in the past four years. All of them have been plain vanilla fixed rate bonds, none with cabs, derivatives, or gigs. So the market is evolving. The next one, as all of you know, GASB 68 placed the liability directly on your balance sheet. And probably more importantly, CalPERS specifically actually has a, a, your UL payments are fixed dollar payments, right? So you're on a, on, on a payment, looks and sounds just like a loan. They all now have these standard 10 year call features like your traditional municipal bonds. So they make whole call, the market is evolved. Extend payment or refinance normal costs. So we tell you typically finance the same term or shorter. Don't extend your payments. In the past, people were doing these because they did not have sound financial management practices or seeing that as different. The rating agencies that now see it as credit neutral, specifically because point number two, it's already on the balance sheet. The last part, that is what we're here to talk about. That is a risk. There is market and timing risk. And there are things you can do, dollar cost averaging, multiple strategies, hedging. But the one point that I think is important to talk about, Dan, and the GFA doesn't mention this, is regardless of what the source of the money is, you're always subject to market and timing risk, right? If the money comes from reserves, you won the lottery, you had a scratcher and you decided to send it off to CalPERS, you are subject to the exact same market time and risk. And that's important for anyone to understand or to think about uh, in, in an objective manner. So uh, 
This is a quote from the Illinois Public Pension Fund Associations. In fact, it's, it's a white paper that, um, that addresses um, you know, some of the risks, you know, and, and it's important to note that they don't recommend or not recommend this financing technique, um, but they are comfortable saying what it's not. And uh, they, they concluded that a POB is not a risky arbitrage bet. In fact, um, if it's done right, it's a well thought out financing technique in which responsible parties examine and understand the risk and the probability of substantially lower taxes uh, being needed to meet pension obligations. Uh, and, and it goes on to say, another piece of, inf uh, piece of information in this review is that the projected taxation uh, needed to amortize the UAL through 2040 um, is something that a community should be looking at uh, regardless and to see how our you know, not just put your head in the sand, but, but how is it that you're going to uh, fund those long-term uh, obligations or promises that you've made to your employee? Does anybody else want to chime in here? That's a great article. Um, I think it's about 10, 15 pages in very plain English. It kind of, it talks about the pluses and minuses, but it, it's demystifying what a lot of this is, but at the same time says there is some risk involved. So I, I think it's a really good thing for people to read. I wish I had drafted it. <laughs> so now we're gonna get into a little bit of uh, pension funding. And um, I believe Ira, you, you were gonna- So, so yeah, as you know, and, and what one of the things Julio mentioned earlier is the importance of having a uh, total holistic approach to being able to fund your pension plan, not just what you're doing now, but how you're going to deal with any portions of the unfunded. If you're not issuing bonds, how are you going to pay off the unfunded liability? If you are issuing bonds, how are you going to deal with the unfunded liability that you haven't uh, refinanced at the lower rate? And how are you going to deal with new unfunded liability that appears in the future? Um, we, the, these are actually pictures of, from the updated version of the software that we are currently um, in the process of, of putting together. Because we, it's very important to, have, to be able to take different perspectives on your funding, to be able to look at all the different ways that money is coming out from your general fund uh, and going towards the pension plan, whether that's coming out of the general fund to make required contributions or additional contributions, whether you're making it towards your unfunded liability or your normal cost, whether you're making it for bond payments. Uh, it, because Just because you have issued bonds and your unfunded liability payment may go away, doesn't mean that you're not making the payments, the bond counts as money that you are paying to pay off prior unfunded liability. So you want to look at all the different pieces. So that's what this perspective is. I we created this another graph, which is the next slide. And that shows this from CalPERS perspective. Um, are we switching to the next slide? Hang on, uh, I think uh, Julio wanted to chime in. And I think that the other, this isn't an elephant in a room, maybe a giraffe, but also there's OPEB, right? There's, we're not even addressing OPEB, but you can incorporate that in your projections, correct? The PAYGO cost? Right. So yeah, this is, we're, right now, today we're just talking about pension, but everything that applies to pension also applies to OPEB. You have the ability to, you, you can, you know, if you have an opportunity to issue debt um, to get that money invested, to be able to get a better return on that and to be able to pay off your unfunded liability on OPEB, that's something that you should be thinking about, talking about, coming up with a complete plan for addressing all of your long-term liabilities. So this because is essentially going, a labor costing module. You can put in salaries, every other component, and you can tell them 80% of their budget essentially, right? With all the components in there, is that correct? Which is, that's, that's, not, that's not this graph, but we have, we have financial software that can help them look at that because for most agencies, cities, um, 
counties, um, you know, eighty percent of your budget is going to be labor, and making sure that you ha you understand the co all the costs associated with labor, not just now, not just getting through this year's budget crisis, but moving on in the future. Um, one of the things we'll be talking about in a few slides relates to uh, some of the some of the reasons why. Uh, so the, the pensions are, have gotten to be such a big concern uh, as costs have risen over time. And um, although, yeah, I, it, can, can we at least go to the next slide, get through this, and then we'll, we'll address these other issues because I do want to make sure that they see, you know, this is being able to look at this, again, focusing on pension, whether it's pension or OPEB, both from the perspective of money coming, all the, all the pieces of money coming out of your, of your, your budget, all the pieces of money going towards CalPERS so you can see them all, understand them all, and be able to take a big picture approach to, to all of this, whether it is through making additional contributions from surpluses you may have in your budget, from new revenue sources as they become available, uh, whether it is putting money temporarily into a 115 trust to be able to give you flexibility between years to be able to start addressing some unfunded liability concerns before they appear at CalPERS. Um, you know, so th these are all you know, uh, things that are gonna be, that are popping up and things that are gonna be available in our software uh, starting at the end of the month. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And this will give Julio a chance to talk about all the different, where unfunded liability comes from and how it's getting funded. Okay, I'm gonna set this to a two minute timer. We're gonna go. So many of you know, this is usually like page 14 or 17. Your UAL is a past due payment. And it's actually something that CalPERS trues up every year. So they add a new base onto your liability. As you can see, this is uh, one of our clients and they have a total of 43 bases. And you say each and every year, they're essentially a series of loans at 7%. So the reason that's important, and, and Dan, right, they started this one in 2013, when they implemented uh, a number of these changes, they started to say, if you give us an additional payment, you have to specify what base. And that's what's important because some of you may not address the entire liability on day one. You may decide I can make $2 million worth of payments. And if you do, you can strategically decide how to apply those payments. So. You have these bases, you should consider them a series of loans. Next slide, Paige. We look at it as a layer cake. So this is an example of what it looks like. Each one of those bases has a payment stream. You do get credits in that years. We often find that the elected officials like this slide specifically, some pretty colors. Next slide. Five point four million. Yes. Are, are you? I'm sorry. Are you still there? Okay. Yes. Okay. Can you not hear me? You, you I got lost I, for a moment. Oh, yes. It's. I don't know why around this time it's unstable. So your payments go from five point four to seven point seven million dollars peaking. Almost every agency peaks between two thousand thirty and thirty two. And next slide. I think it's important to show this perspective. Because I think there are a number of, this, of these agencies who've kind of been white knuckling it year by year. The costs go up and up. And I think Ira had mentioned a lot of it is about perspective. You have to look at it just not over the entire agency, but also long term. So a few years ago, your costs were 2 million, 2.8. It's not going to stop until it gets to 7.7. Uh, .7. But remember, this is a snapshot in time. So you could have new bases added on in the future. That's why you have to actively manage it. I think that's uh, my slides, right? Oh, last part. So we talk about a base selection strategy. As you can see, this is an example of base number four, which was a nine year term. You can see the payments and what the impact is, what the cost savings is. Annually, it's greater. Overall, it's not as much. If you chose a long base, a 29 year base, you can see that it has a greater impact. Um, on a, on a total basis, you save more money, but the payments are lesser on an annual basis. So if you want to impact your budget, 
or are concerned about the peak in the next couple of years, you apply money to a short base. If you want to maximize total savings, you apply it to a long base. Right. So the answer may be different for different agencies. If you are going through some severe budget struggles right now, you pay off a short base, you give yourself some flexibility, uh, and then hope things get better you know, sometime in the short term. If you have the, the finances and you want to have the longer term savings, you pay off a longer base. Each agency needs to look at its own situation and be able to map out uh, what combination is the right one for your situation? You know, Ira, that's a great point. And I can tell you, I was working with a client and uh, we did a barbell structure. And it's interesting, the long term saved more money, but when you did a barbell structure, short and long, but then you took into consideration that the general fund impact, it ended up saving more money with the deal that saved you less overall savings, but had a greater general fund impact. So this is, this is why the modeling is so important. It really is in the fine details. And when the clients start talking to you, they're like, oh, no, I'm more concerned about what the general fund impact is as opposed to total dollar savings. So, yes, there's modeling, there's analysis. All of this is critical. And I think, you know, the answer isn't always clear cut, too. That's why you have to delve into the numbers sometimes. Right. And this is, this is one of the things that we've worked that we've worked together on in the past. Our software is, has been refined because of this to allow you to pick out particular bases, see the difference between paying them out short term and paying them out long term. More importantly, there is a easy button where you can allow the system to either maximize your long term interest savings or maximize your front end savings uh, for, for if you're under budget duress and need, need to drive your minimum required payment. So you can either select individually um, or, or let the system uh, select uh, for, for you. But certainly you can customize it um, j just uh, you know, in, any, way, any way you like. So the last part, when you, if you recall the beginning, we take a look at it and this is a general rule of thumb but if you're going to apply reserves or one-time money since they carry no interest, you should look to apply it to a long-term base. And this matters as a, as a finance guy for, for nearly 30 years. When you do like a, what we'd call a, a mixed deal, tax exempt and taxable, you'd always do that taxable tail up front because that is the higher borrowing cost. So all else being equal, you'd want to push your POBs to the shortest maturity possible because it has the higher borrowing rate. If you do some kind of tax exempt exchange or leverage refunding, you want to do that later because it has a lower borrowing rate. And you want to pay off or use target your longest basis with cash because there's no carrying cost. So this really is designed to look at a carrying cost, your highest carrying cost for the shortest basis, tax exempt uh, financing type of structure for the medium, and the long term looks at zero or cash payments. This is, a, it's a general rule. It may be different. And when you take a look at this whole process, but you have to think about everything from a portfolio perspective and be strategic about what you're doing. I can tell you this was not the case when we were issuing POBs back in the day. I've been here long a long time ago. I started my career in 1990s uh, and I did my first POB back in the day. And how and what we do is completely different now than what we're doing today. The level of analysis, the insight, and equally important, the transparency of the CalPERS has completely changed. So now we're going to move on to our second polling question of the day, um, which is what does what makes a POB successful? And um, okay, um, launching it. The votes are starting to trickle in. Certainly seems like a tougher question than the first one. About 15% of the votes are in thus far. 
this, this, this is not going to have a very big impact on your final grade. Uh, there'll be a final exam at the end of our session. So, uh, oh, somebody's saying they can't see the polling question. Uh, that makes it tougher to answer. <laughs> you know, in the meantime, someone asked, can you speak to whether fiscal uh, budgetary discipline affects the agency's ability to allow budgetary savings to be redirected? Uh, to governing board direction, uh, discretionary wants. Actually, I think the person at answered their own question there, right? I always tell at the end of the day, as, as people, the polls are coming in, we say this requires long-term sustained financial discipline. And it's kind of a carrot and a stick. That's the stick, the carrot at the end of the day is you're able to lop off that mountain and afford the levels of service and the community projects that your board wants to do. But they have to, they have to kind of button their, uh, pay attention to the pension and their overall costs. And then in the future, they'll be rewarded with the ability to provide a different level of service and capacity. Right. Um, I mean, we, we have discussions with a lot of our clients and, and for many of our clients, pensions tend to be, they tend to regularly be third or fourth on the list of priorities. And if you don't focus long-term, you never get to the things that are third or fourth on the priority list. You're always focusing on the crisis of today. Uh, and part of, part of the process, part of what we try and do to help our clients is to be able to help you understand the things that are gonna be third, fourth, fifth list, fifth on your list of priorities, to be able to make plans beforehand and, and make commitments so that you can start dealing with them. And, that get, and by doing that, it does give you the flexibility to deal with the crises when they come up because it creates more flexibility in your future budgets. Okay, so. uh, looks like some, some folks could uh, weren't able to see the polling. I'm gonna end the polling for now. Um, and... and then we'll start creating the answer anyway. So what the results say, uh, both one and two. Um, and okay. let's, uh, I, I, you know, I'll just kick this off. I think the answer is is two, um, and that the discount rate, ha while it has a tangential uh, um, expectation of future earnings, it is not the right measure. Um, your borrowing, your your discount rate is simply the expectation of future earnings, um, but the success is really what the fund actually earns over the thirty year term. Um, and, uh, I'll, uh, okay, well, I, 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 yeah, I, and I, I want to, I want to refine that answer a little bit, uh, because in the short term, in the short term, whether or not you have savings are determined between the difference between the 7% rate that CalPERS is lending you the money at right now and the rate that you issue the bonds, let's call it four, just so I don't have to do, you know, talk about a lot of digits after the decimal. And almost every bond that's been issued in the last couple of years has gotten a rate lower than four. Uh, so if you can issue at four and you were borrowing at seven, in the short term, at least for the next few years, you can lock in savings in your budget. And that for some may be enough of a success to be able to call this a success. Over the long term though, the whether or not there are savings are determined by, as Dan said, what CalPERS <laughs> actually earns on the money that you've given them. And we can see this in the next few slides. Um, can we see it in the next few slides? Um, <clears throat> I'm doing my best. Okay, okay, so here's a picture of the difference. You know, an another variation of the graph, the blue line is what you would have paid if you did not issue bonds. Uh, the red line, becomes the payment that you're making to the bondholder. So if you issued in this case, 100% to, to refinance at 100% of the, the debt, uh, you see that the gap between the red, the red bars and the blue line are savings. So for this agency issue, I think they were issuing um, 300 plus million in bonds. Their projected savings was 178 million, a huge amount of projected savings. We go to the next slide and we see what happens instead if instead of earning seven, they earn 6%. As CalPERS returns get lower, if they do not hit their 7% target, the blue line goes up a little bit because you would have paid more to CalPERS if they fell short. 
but you have new unfunded liability payments that are coming in, the green bars that are getting created. And the green bars are growing faster than the blue line is going up because you just handed CalPERS 300, 400, somewhere between 300 and 400 million dollars of extra money. And they fell short of their target, not just on the money they had before, but also on that extra money. So that caused the unfunded liability to go up and the amount to cross. Now at 6%, there's still, aren't, there's still significant savings. The next slide shows at 5% across the board, the savings drops down. And at 4%, which is the rate that we issued the bond, that we hypothetically issued the bonds at, we saw a, a little bit of loss, pretty much a break even. So, you know, this is basically showing and answers the question somebody was asking earlier of if I issue bonds at four and I've been borrowing at seven, isn't that enough? And that's a good start but it's not enough because in the long term, it comes down to if you ish borrow the money at four and CalPERS earns more than four, you're doing okay. If CalPERS earns less than four, in hindsight, uh, you probably should have made another decision. So, um, and that's, that's the first part of understanding the, the risks associated with pension obligation bonds. And the next slide, the next slide is a summary showing how as your actual investment returns go down, your savings end up going down. And while the dollar amounts may shift from client to client, the basic concept stays the same. Uh, now, this was all a simplified version. We assumed that the return that the CalPERS got were level and consistent across time. Uh, but as you know, uh, that's not the way CalPERS works because they're invested in the markets. So next slide. So uh, this is from a 2012 CDAC presentation um, called the Economics of, of Pension Obligation Funding. I thought it was a pretty good presentation. It's there on their website. Uh, but you know, they, they note that evaluating the risks of POB is considerably more involved uh, than simply comparing the existing assumed rate of return or the discount rate and the cost of borrowing for a very specific uh, situation. Um, uh, you know, POVs are, are I guess, um, very specific uh, to, to, your, to your agency. Uh, and, 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 you know, what the reasons may differ than trying to achieve long-term savings or uh, perhaps maybe it is, uh, to Iris point, um, part of it is to achieve some some early uh, uh, budget flexibility by driving that minimum minimal contrib contribution down. Um, um, they also note um, that you know you you know really you know, they're complex and having an actuary on board as part of your finance team is, 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 is you know, something that uh, your agency should be considering. Um, and, you know, I think, I think what we've all been saying, you know, no matter, you know, what, um, you know, I think all of us, including other FAs, uh, have really glommed on to this notion, if you're going to go through it, your agency and your board should go through it with, uh, their eyes wide open um, and understanding that the savings is really a long-term proposition because you won't, if, if, the, if you define success as achieving overall interest savings, you're really not going to know until the end term of, 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 that, um, of that issue. Uh, and you know, I, I like to say, I think uh, other, other FAs have made the same point. Um, it's like any leveraged investment, POB proceeds invested in the market will increase your upside gains if, if the market does well and increase losses if the market does poorly. So it's this, you know, uh, amplification of both uh, potential uh, rewards, as well as the amplification of the downside risk. So yeah, so handing CalPERS more money and having them, you know, if, if, you, if we could go back in time, 
to the beginning of the year because CalPERS is up about 15% this year right now and right. issue the bonds knowing that they were going to take off, that would have been brilliant. Uh, and some agencies got lucky uh, and did that. Um, the, uh, you know, one of the things that's very important to understand with this is that the you know, big gains or losses in the short term can have a huge impact on the success or failure of your pension obligation bonds, whether or not uh, they make they they lower your long term costs will be determined very much by returns in the first couple of years after issuing the bonds, and that becomes one of the the biggest risks, biggest concerns, uh, because trying to guess where the market's going uh, is not uh, in any of our area of expertise. So you know to to reiterate Iris' points. Um, you could see that that uh, you know that if we could uh, you know if and you know it's it's a big if if we could time the market you know the ideal time to issue POBs are when interest rates are low and when the market is poised for a sustained growth run. Uh, but it's you know it's always difficult uh, to 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 you know uh, time the market. Um, and as I also pointed out that earnings and losses early in on a transaction are obviously more impactful than gains and losses towards the end of the term. Um, and you know that a lot of that goes to you know just how things compound over time. So if you're starting off um, in a you know large positive position, you have uh, additional time to to you know. Uh, well, it, it gives you a buffer if there are losses down the road. Conversely, if you take big losses in the beginning, it's much harder to, to crawl out um, and, and you know, it be a, uh, represent a savings at the end of the day. Now, we know that historically interest rates are very low and we think that's driving a lot of um, the interest in POBs right now. But that's one part of the transaction. So we issue debt low, uh, but there's that old adage, you know, uh, buy low and, and sell uh, uh, high in the market. So, you know, we're borrowing low, um, but are we buying um, at a high point in the market? And I would argue, yeah, there's some concern there. So this is uh, one of the measures that people use to see um, where, you know, where is the, the, uh, the, the market? Um, and, uh, you know, so, so this is, this ratio um, has been developed um, that it, 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 it at least is a, um, a, a metric uh, that can help you you know, so if, if the if the CAPE ratio is is high, it could be an uh, reflect that lower returns over the next couple of years or decades. Whereas the if the CAPE ratio uh, was lower, then higher returns over the next couple of decades um, uh, might occur as as the markets revert back to the mean. But this is showing that since. Um, just from a year ago, that the ratio has increased 35% just in one year. And a similar ratio um, is, uh, th this is the total market capitalization compared to the previous year. It's, um, it's up 147% from the, from the prior year. Again, a concerning <clears throat> of the valuation of, 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 of the market. And then we'll, but uh, so, so th there are really two components. It's where, you know, what can the markets reasonably return over the next year and where can you borrow? And that spread between the two is, you know, hopefully it represents your, your margin of error and you want, um, um, I, ideally, 
um, a, a, a fairly big spread. <clears throat> And right, and it's not designed, you know, th this is, th there's no simple rule, foolproof rule on doing this because uh, one of the reasons, a big reason why the Fed lowers rates when they do and keeps them low is because they believe the economy is weak without it. So this is their way of keeping things under control, uh, not necessarily their way to shoot the stock market through the roof. So, you know, the, you're going to have to make some decisions. Um, the lower rates you can get, the better. And the lower rate, and, and again, it's not just that rates overall are low, it's the rates you can get in your bonds. And this, that's why it's important to, to take a look at this graph uh, that Julio put together. If I can only say one thing beforehand, Dan, you know, we go through a whole process with every client. We talk about issuing in multiple tranches. We talk extensively about the risk. In fact, if you're not looking at risk and you're not looking at a pension funding policy and developing a long-term plan, uh, you're doing it wrong. So having said all of that, I'm gonna look at, is it still compelling? It is because many cities especially, and these are all cities that have issued, don't have very many other options. But as you see, these are the 10 year rates for these POBs and with the exception of Placentia, which is a triple B credit, one, one of the things you'll notice is that these were all highly rated. Almost all of them are double A plus, uh, double A rated or, or better. So they're well rated. They're not in the financial difficulty. Some of these don't have the best track record, but rating wise, they're in a much better position. But as you can see, we did the city of Glendora deal in 2019 and their 10 year rate was 232. At the time it was the lowest borrowing for POB in time. And then the market, as we all know, had some, this is the impact of, one COVID in the uncertainty in the market, but you see now that even though treasury rates have increased a bit, the POB spreads have compressed significantly. And overall, it still is at a very, <clears throat> after Manhattan Beach, I think El Segundo was just recently done. They had a 257 all in TIC. So from the borrowing side, it's compelling. Dan, you asked the $100,000 question, is it still the right timing? Um, I know in the case of uh, El Cajon, for example, we broke it up into two tranches. We did the first tranche. We waited. In fact, we had a huge conversation of whether we would wait before the election, after the election. We waited till after the election, then after the year. And then because CalPERS specifically gives you a card for the fiscal year, we said we'd issue this fiscal year. And next year, uh, which will come in 30 days, we'll come into this discussion of the issuing the next tranche. Um, so you have some that are doing multiple strategies and other concepts, but the idea is they're still very attractive rates. As, as I was as an example, right now it, in this market, you're still borrowing around a three handle or lower. So it is very compelling from a budgetary perspective. It's, I cannot absolutely answer whether the market is going to react one way or another. And there are certain hedging strategies. Um, and that might be the other part of the discussion, right? What can you do to mitigate that investment loss or the investment risk? And, and well, that, that has come up uh, by a number of folks have, have asked, and Julio, I'm not sure if you're comfortable answering this question, but um, can you use a Section 115 plan? Can you deposit POB proceeds or LRB port proceeds or lease revenue bonds into a Section 115 to in essence, dollar cost, perhaps to, as a, a rationale to dollar cost average into the market over a number of years. Um, <clears throat> and that ha seems to, the, the answer used to be in California that POBs, it was clear, the answer was no, but for lease revenue bonds, it was, you had more flexibility. But um, it, it appears that some bond councils say they're okay with depositing EOB proceeds into a 115 trust and having that transferred over to, to CalPERS over a period of time. Julio, what, do you, what, what have you been seeing? If I, yes, can I step one, just step back one uh, comment. Pension obligation bonds do not need voter approval. You typically have to go through a voter uh, validation process and you use the refunding law. So the interpretation is some bond council believe when you send the refunding law, you have to send the money immediately to CalPERS. 
I have other bond counsel who say, well, if the money's going to CalPERS or it's in a 115 trust, it's just like any other kind of refinancing. They don't talk to time. And in fact, the law talks to that. So the answer is it depends on who, what your bond counsel says. But I will say, you and I have been obviously having a conversation with the people at CalPERS for a long time. And you may have been on that CSFMO discussion when they started talking about kind of that PERP B, that lower yielding component. I do believe you can do that. And you also answered the last question. You can also do a COP structure. Now, some people have an issue leasing their streets or sewer pipes. However, the advantage to that clearly is that you can take the proceeds since you're, and then place them into a 115 trust. Now, the most important policy consideration, and this is now me putting on a former CM hat, is now I own that risk. And that's really important, right? Because once you take that, Right now, CalPERS can be blamed for whatever investment performance, but once you put in that 115 trust, you are now directing those investments or more directly related to the outcome of those investments. So be aware, it may be this unintended consequence that you have more control, but you also have more culpability for the outcome of that investment return. But the long and short is, yes, it depends on bond counsel. Um, sometimes I've suggested people do for example, because the validation process takes four to six months, we suggest, well, if you have some assets, do a COP for one tranche if you're going to do it. Go through the validation because you always want that uh, ca capacity. And if you're going to do the second tranche, do those with POVs and kind of merge the two. Because you probably want to spend some money right away with CalPERS anyway. So as you know, as you said, it's a far more nuanced process. It requires a lot of modeling and thought and depends on the individual circumstances of the client but bond counsel will give you certain decisions. I think there are ways around it. Some of it may be the headline risk you may avoid with the COPs as well. So there's no clear cut or simple answer, I guess is my end conclusion. Right, this, this becomes an issue of tactics. How do you, if you have decided that you wanna take this as part of the approach, what are the exact steps you're gonna be taking um, to go through this? And, and for, for some, some of the discussions I know that I've been involved in, the, the thought of using the 115 trust in, instead of doing multiple tranches, which may add significant cost to it, to be able to take some of the money, put it in uh, a relatively low risk investment in a 115 trust. Uh, if the market tanks, you've held on to your value and then you can move the money over to CalPERS at some point. It's, a, it's, a, it's another tactic that some can look at as a way to be able to, to lower the risk associated with uh, the market dropping because of the, the huge impact that that may have. And uh, oh, by the way, you know, this is it mainly, this issue is, is uh, it's not unique to California, but we're specifically speaking to California law. In other states, it's perfectly fine to put POB proceeds directly into a 115 trust. But in California, um, there, 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 there is, uh, it will, as Julio said, you'll, you will uh, have to def defer to your bond counsel on whether yeah, that's something probably, that's. Although some states also don't allow 115 trusts at all. So uh, for well, those of you who are thing, planning though. on leaving California uh, because you're getting frustrated by all this, uh, there are other problems in other states too. A 115 trust is an IRS designation. It doesn't have to be for pension. So that's the, it has to be used for governmental purposes and you, have, and you have to designate what they are. One last thing that you also say, Dan, is the money goes in, but you can be flexible because you can use it to pay for normal costs as well. So it's not necessarily ironclad that once it goes in, the money can't go out. So say you need $3 million, you can say, oh, I'm going to use this to pay $3 million of normal costs. And then you have some flexibility. It's not a complete loss. It is, but that gets back to the point that you made that you made way earlier in the presentation that P POB 1.0 people were using them a lot more to pay off things like normal cost. Oh, this version, you know, it's uh, you know, as, I, I as call as much that the as Detroit can. rule in my presentations. You just don't want to do anything the city of Detroit does. <laughs> All right, let's uh, moving right along. So, um you know, all the, that being said, um, POBs, we are seeing a huge spike <coughs> in 
in the popularity of POBs. You've probably heard it from your neighbors, uh, but um, our friends at CDAC track this kind of information. They've been tracking it since uh, I think their first POB issuer was in 1985. It was the city of Oakland. And you can see the volume over the years. And okay, there was the early 90s recession. That may have been part of it. And then the dot com and, and then, oop, uh, excuse me. Um, uh, then... Um, but as you know, we've got this uh, lopsided pandemic recession, but interest rates being so low, uh, 2020 was the higher, highest record, uh, highest year on record in California. So all of, for over the 35 year period, there were $30 billion issued in POBs. In 2020 alone, there um, have been uh, 4.2 billion issued. And uh, as I understand it, 2021 is tracking to uh, perhaps even outpace uh, 20. So anyone else have comments on this slide? And any other questions that we have from anyone in the, in the audience right now? There is one question that uh, perhaps we can take at the end, um, which is, you know, what's what's the best way to um, present this to council, or, or you know, what does council need to know? And that that is a uh, a, a longer question. But Julio, perhaps you can speak to the. Um, this current slide, which is kind of a synopsis of, of, of the POB issues that occurred in, in the last several years. Yeah, um, really, as you can see, most of it started in 2017, it's been three, four years. We have, it, I think, at least $1.2 billion in the pipeline that we know of, and even more under consideration that are studying, and that's just our firm alone. So um, you can assume that it's going to be pretty sizable. Look, it's nearly $6 billion I think the real interesting thing is when you start looking at the ratings, what the ratings of these are. Um, they are much stronger ratings. I don't want to beat up Placentia, but they are. So did Placentia just turn off his internet? Or is it mine? Nope, I think we lost him. Dan, are you still there? Okay, we lost both of them. Okie doke. <laughs> All so. right, uh, Ira, Ira, can you, you forge ahead? I know we're already at time, folks, and thanks for giving us your time today. So Ira, do you wanna wrap us up with a few of these slides? Uh, if, except I can't move the slides around. Gotcha, um, no problem. Um, that was the end of the Dan? slides, right, Dan? Pretty much. Okay, Great. so um, yeah, I, I, and what it comes down to, uh, really is is that the, the pension obligation bonds are, are there there is a compelling case for pension obligation bonds for talking about pension obligation bonds for looking at that now where there may not have been five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, the important thing is to be able to understand a lot of the risks. And when when we're talking about the, the question of how do you bring this up to your city council, to your county board of supervisors, I think it's important to get them to understand uh, the potential savings, how this may help you, and to get them to understand the risks. That it, the education and discussion of your pension and your OPEB debt as a whole over the long term, and to be able to understand how this fits in the total picture. Education becomes part of it. Uh, I know when we work with agencies, uh, we start with basic education and the, the result of the, the discussion is usually a question of do is, you know, now I understand pension obligation bonds, no thank you, it's not for me, or yes, I'd like to earn, learn more. That's the way the steps should be going. 
you know, is this enough for me to understand to say we're not interested? Or do we want to get into more and more detail, more and more complexity? Because to do this right, you need to constantly be looking at this, constantly be monitoring it, constantly be paying attention. And you can get help from our firm, from Julio's firm, and from others to do this. Uh, but you need to understand each step along the way, because ultimately the responsibility of this uh, is yours, is the city's. Um, and I don't know if Dan and Julio are back now with solid internet so that uh, maybe not. So. Um, All right, folks. I think we, we've covered quite a bit of ground today. And I just wanna say thank you to our panelists for this discussion. Um, obviously, as Iris stated, GovInvest is here to talk through this opportunity and your options with you. Um, I did drop into the chat box a link. So if you would like to book a meeting to really connect with us about this further, uh, please do click on that link. Um, also, if you are a current client, please feel free to email us at success at govinvest.com and let us know how we can help. Um, in the meantime, please look for the replay to this session in your inbox um, later on today, and I will be providing a, a copy of the, of the presentation as well. Um, please do feel, feel free to reach out with any questions, and thanks again. And, and we want to let you know that we've been informed that uh, the problems coming up today were problems that Zoom's been having all over the place. Uh, this is not a reflection of, of necessarily uh, anybody's internet, either yours or ours right now. But thanks for taking the time for joining us, uh, asking questions, and we're happy to answer more questions as it comes along. All right. Thanks for everyone. We'll, we'll be logging off and uh, check your inbox for the presentation this slide.